I worked uh, for the last uh, 40 years in, uh, at the Rawat Research Institute in Aberdeen. Uh, I no longer work there, but uh, this is um, one of the premier uh, nutrition research institutes of the world. Well, it certainly is the, one of the largest uh, nutrition research institutes, but it is mainly animal uh, nutrition. There is a, a, a human component in it, uh, but uh, um, it is mainly animal nutrition. Now that, in a sense, uh, uh, predetermined the uh, sort of uh, things which uh, we are doing. I was always interested in plants and uh, crop plants and legume plants. Um, we were very interested in particular um, uh, parts of, of the um, uh, plant constituents, uh, which are normally called uh, anti-nutrients. Um, these are um, compounds which uh, are present in, um, in plants, uh, which don't do much good to us. Um, they are uh, have a nutritive value, but because of some structural or other features, uh, enzymic features, they are um, not doing us much good. Uh, but because uh, uh, these are still food and we eat them, um, it came to the attention of the biotechnologist soon that what is uh, possibly uh, a problem for us may certainly be a problem for the insects. And this is uh, our entry into uh, uh, genetic modification, quite particularly taking uh, uh, some genes, uh, uh, lectin genes, uh, either from plants, uh, higher plants or lower plants, bacteria, and uh, use them in that uh, context um, to see what is the um, effect of these uh, potentially harmful effect on, on, on insects. When the um, uh, genetic modification uh, uh, business came along, um, then um, we had this uh, um, uh, sort of study extended uh, to, to insects. Quite literally, if it does uh, do some harm to the insects, uh, uh, alimentary tract or uh, digestive system or whatever, uh, the, uh, and if it is not doing uh, similar harmful things to the uh, higher consumers like mammalians, um, then uh, we'll be in business. Um, so our job was, uh, uh, in a sense, to identify uh, potentially uh, useful um, uh, natural insecticidal genes in plants, those which uh, um, would not harm us as higher uh, consumers of, of the same crops. We had a, a very big uh, research group, um, usually between 18 to 20 people, because the, the European Union sent, uh, we were at an accepted teaching laboratory, and uh, they sent a, a lot of postdocs uh, to us with all the money uh, that they all had. And this research group was uh, headed uh, since 1990 uh, by my uh, wife and colleague, uh, Dr. Susan Bardotz. And uh, um, uh, we uh, sort of agreed at the beginning, not just with her, but with the other members of the team, that um, this would be a, a, a good adventure for us. We really thought that this was a great idea. Uh, we're going to look at it. We come up with, uh, based on our experience with non-GM foods, we will come up with a, a credible and scientifically solid uh, uh, risk assessment procedure. And in fact, the, uh, that nearly $3 million um, uh, research uh, grant, which we did get, which was for three institutes um, uh, collaborating in this project, and I coordinated the, the, the project. This was uh, to uh, 
uh, draw up a blueprint for um, uh, risk assessment, which uh, we work it out on, on, on a, um, you know, a model, which in our case was the uh, genetically modified potatoes, but it would have general uh, applicability. So the, the um, uh, regulatory authorities can use this method uh, and demand that sort of uh, uh, data from the companies in, in order to evaluate uh, the um, uh, safety or otherwise of, uh, of that particular genetically modified uh, crop. If we, for example, find uh, a gene whose product is uh, uh, likely to be very detrimental to uh, a target insect, which we regarded as a pest, uh, and it, which it would not uh, damage us, or the damage would be minimal, then uh, that, uh, the establishment of this uh, would serve as a good blueprint for risk assessment. So this is why we, we, we really started. Uh, now in our case, it was with the potatoes. We had, a, 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 in Scotland, there is a major problem with uh, aphids. And uh, the aphids uh, are controlled under normal conditions, what we call ladybirds, and you, in your case, you call them ladybugs. Uh, so we extended the studies even to this, uh, what we call scientifically tritrophic interactions, uh, where we looked at, at the, okay, we did the, uh, the genetic modifications, the plants were growing in the greenhouse, we release uh, aphids, and so we can measure the the actual damage, uh, and then we release uh, ladybugs uh, into the same system and see uh, how they are affecting the whole system. Would the, the ladybugs be affected? You know, this is, uh, it was the, the days before Losi's uh, monarch butterflies, uh, and there, there were quite a number of studies, uh, like um, uh, in Switzerland, uh, uh, to see if, if uh, uh, apart from the uh, target insect, the target pest, shall we be doing any damage to uh, other things which we consider the good guys? About a year and a half into the uh, project, uh, the, the, the storm clouds started to gather. Uh, one of the first ones was not by us, uh, but by um, um, the... Uh, the entomologists. You see that in science, you normally have, uh, if you put in a, a gene and a gene product is expressed, um, uh, the effects of that uh, should uh, correlate with the amount of expression in plain language. Uh, if you have a, a, a method of estimating, let's say, in, on, in, on a uh, leaf, uh, what uh, uh, is the expression of, uh, of that gene product. And then you put it into this uh, system of uh, releasing the aphids, and you measure the damage or the protection which the, the gene conferred on the plant. If you uh, 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 correlate protection with the expression level, you must have a, a good correlation.